this is ridiculous. I've read this many books. Okay. This is dangerous. Hi everyone, it's Reagan and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be doing my July wrap up, which honestly, if, as I was gathering all the books to chat about for this video, I think this is the most I have ever read both at the number of books and the number of pages in a single month. I'm honestly a little shook at myself. I'm very proud, but I honestly have no idea what happened. I also did a bunch of reading vlogs this month, so I feel like most of these books you should have seen in some capacity within some of those vlogs. So if you're curious on some like really deep thoughts on those, be sure to kind of check back on my current reading vlogs. With that being said, I loved so many things I read this month. I'm very inspired going into the new month. So let's just go ahead and dive right in and talk about the book. So the first book I'm going to talk about is one of the worst books I did read this month, so I'm going to be quick about it, and that is Grave Peril by Jim Butcher. This is book three to the Dresden Files series, which is an urban fantasy wizard detective story. Um, things I do enjoy about this book, I enjoy the sort of fantastical mystery that's kind of at its heart. It does have great humor. They're really fast to read. They're both serialized versus kind of like mystery of the week combined with sort of this overarching story that seems to be kind of hinted at behind the scenes. That being said, a lot of the problems I have with this series I really feel like shine very brightly in this third novel. Um, Harry Dresden's voice, especially his voice when talking about women, personally makes me a little uncomfortable and I haven't really loved being in his head, especially in this third novel. I've heard a lot of people tell me that the third book on things get really a lot better so maybe I will check out this series in the future. But for now I feel like I've read the first three books in the series. I ultimately gave this third one like a 2.75, 2.5 out of 5 stars. While I enjoy the magic and the mystery and the adventure, Harry Dresden is just not someone I feel like I want to read from, from a POV perspective. I've had a lot of discussions with you guys about this series and I feel a lot of you feel the same, um, which is where I'm getting a lot of this advice from. So that's the first book I read this month. Again, I might continue the series another day, another year, but for now, I think I am, I'm good. I think I'm good with this particular series. From there though, I did read quite a slew of amazing books. The first two books I read this month were actually in participation of the Greedathon, which is an awesome readathon that happened in the beginning of this month celebrating Korean culture and books. Um, I read two books for it. The first one is Anna Kay, which is a contemporary retelling of Anna Karenina. Going into this, I did not know the story of Anna Karenina at all, so let's just say all the twists and turns of the story really took me by storm. I've also since found out that this is being adapted into a television show, which honestly is going to be excellent. This book reads like a teen drama in all of the best ways. It's absolutely absurd. It's a story that follows kind of a large cast of characters um, set in kind of a prestigious New York City background. We follow Anna Kay, we follow her brother. Anna Kay is sort of this beautiful, enigmatic character that kind of floats between all social circles. She's really talented, she's beautiful. She kind of has her whole life planned out in front of her, but when she kind of starts falling in love with the wrong person, despite having a boyfriend, there's sort of this complicated romance at the center. We also follow a bunch of other POVs from Anna's brother, who's kind of this party boy, to his girlfriend and her sister, as well as his close friend and tutor. All of these different characters sort of have their moments to shine, and you kind of follow them as all of these beautiful, rich, young people like live a life that is so hard to even imagine in this sort of glittering New York setting. It's absolutely captivating. It's very addicting and absurd. So I would say know that going in that this is not a realistic interpretation of the high school experience, but as it's trying to interpret this sort of grand opulence of Anna Karenina's time period, kind of translating what it's like to have these glamorous balls into high school parties. I do feel like the author was very successful in that. Also, given that this is a retelling of a very dramatic story, um, this is a very dramatic story that definitely kind of kept me guessing and shocked me by the end of it, but obviously if you've read Anna Karenina you should kind of see that coming. Um, there is actually going to be a sequel, which I'm intrigued by. This was no means a perfect book. Um, I was definitely entertained the whole way through, and I'm definitely excited to see this adapted into a television show where I think it's going to do a great job, but definitely know what you're getting to going in. This is kind of like an escalated absurd high school experience, by no means like relatable characters, nor a relatable rootable romance, if that makes sense. But anyway, I ended up giving this a 3.75, super entertaining. I read it in less than 24 hours, so 
first book I read. From there I also picked up The Silence of Bones by June Her, which is a Joseon era thriller novel which I just was so captivated by. This is set as I said in the Joseon period and we follow our main character who is an indentured servant. In this era and in this time period in Korea men are not allowed to touch women so therefore the police department relies on indentured servants and female employees to you know deal with the corpse, question female suspects and family members and all sorts of things like that. At the beginning of the story it opens obviously on a murder and our main character is kind of drawn into it and she's very curious and honestly a very good detective. However, things sort of begin to change when her primary detective that she works under begins to become a suspect for the murder itself. This is a book that is so entrancing. One, the atmosphere and the historical setting is so wonderfully rooted in this book, I just felt transported to another place, another time. It was so well crafted in that way. Another component of the story outside of the murder and the mystery surrounding that murder and the suspense of trying to figure out who has done it, there's also kind of a cultural setting of this. This is also set during a time of a change of political power and there's also the rise of Christianity in Korea and the new individuals rising to power are trying to kind of squash it and using Christianity as a way to also sort of scapegoat their political rivals so there's a lot of dissent culturally going on as well. Um, there's also elements of family and family duty wrapped up in an absolutely enthralling mystery novel as well. I really enjoyed this. I loved reading from our main character's perspective. The mystery gripped me. Again, the historical setting I thought was excellent. I really would highly recommend this book. I gave it like a 4.25 out of 5 stars. Another book I obviously read um, very quickly as I read it for in a 24-hour period, but this is one I enjoyed and I really want to read more books in the Joseon era period. Next book I read this month was The Poppy War, which is a book I feel like I have not stopped talking about since I've read it. It was just one that completely captivated me. It's also a book that kind of is divisive. Like some people love it, some people do not love it. I definitely fall in the camp of love. I respect and appreciate everything the author did and accomplished in this first novel. And I'll be quickly reading book two in preparation for book three that comes out later this year. But this is a grim, dark fantasy story inspired by Chinese history. Its influences include the Song Dynasty, the Opium Wars, as well as the Sino-Japanese War. All of those influences are definitely felt in this. It feels very historically rooted. It feels very well crafted as a fantasy world that you would want and it is so satisfying to read. This is an adult grimdark fantasy novel though so please keep that in mind before picking it up. Grimdark fantasy is generally characterized by its amoral characters, amoral settings, and in general I would say this book definitely explores the darkness of war and is not glamorizing anything and it does have a bunch of different trigger warnings that I definitely just want to call out and make known. Um, this is a story where we follow our main character Rin who in the first half of this book is a student at a very elite military academy and at the beginning of this book Rin basically studied to take a test to be able to escape poverty and her scores allowed her to be accepted into this really elite school. However when she gets there she quickly realizes that she's still very much ostracized both for her peasant class upbringing, for her darker complexion, and for being a female. The second half of this book pivots very quickly to a war setting and those contrasts, the school setting and the war setting, I think so successfully kind of pair against each other. The contrasts of these two parts of the book I feel like are incredibly successful because while we're in the school setting, we're there with Rin and all of her fears, all of her goals are completely justified and rooted in that reality. But all of those expectations and desires are honestly shattered in the second half of this book when our main character and all of her classmates and everyone in this world are confronted with war and honestly just survival. And it kind of puts a different perspective on actions and relationships that are kind of reevaluated in the second half of this book in such a successful and interesting way. It also has elements of magic, shaman magic, as Rin, while she's in school, discovers that she has a bit of a talent for it, and this definitely evolves in the second half of the book as well. This is a book that will definitely shock you, and we follow our main character, Rin, who ultimately is not necessarily making the best and most just and right decisions, but you still always understand how she got to the point of ultimately making the choices that she does. This is a excellent novel that I feel like will just sweep you away. It had so many detailed and rich historical influences that shine through it. It's an exceptional first book in a series. Again, it's very dark, but I just felt like it was incredibly successful. I gave it a five out of five stars. Can't wait to read the sequel. 
please read this book. From there I continued on a very emotional journey and picked up The Empire of Gold this month by S.A. Chakraborty. This is the third and final book within the Davabad trilogy, which is by far and away one of my favorite adult fantasy trilogies. It is excellent, it is amazing, I feel like I talk about it a lot for good reason, and this third and final book was an excellent concluding novel. It was satisfying, it wrapped everything up you wanted it to be, it was fast paced, it brought the plot to just new heights. I loved this so much, still emotional thinking about it, but if you're not familiar with this fantasy series, the Davabad Trilogy is a multi-POV, Middle Eastern inspired fantasy series, and the first one we follow our main character, Nahri, who is a thief in Cairo, and unwittingly accidentally summons a warrior jinn, and is spirited away to this very magical city um, that has intense political divisions that have been present for thousands of years. These political divisions kind of come to a boiling point throughout this entire series, and all of our characters within this book are basically trying to hurdle those and quell and support their own people while also trying to prevent the city from being torn apart. It is an emotional ride, it is a highly political ride, it is so well done. I love Nahri, I love Ali, it's full of so many incredible and dynamic characters and again just sort of the political ups and downs within this I just think are so well crafted. Nothing is easily earned. This is not a book where our main character appears out of nowhere, solves all the problems overnight, she gets a hunky boyfriend and we move on. No. No, this is a series that takes place over a long time and is trying to tap into the pain and multi-generational hatred that exists within a city, but also recognizing the love and the community that underlies all of it. It is beautiful. I loved the third novel. Five out of five stars. I could have not have asked for a better concluding story. Seriously read it, it is so good. From there I unfortunately traversed into an unsatisfying novel that I ultimately did DNF but I wanted to quickly mention and that is from Unseen Fire. This was a buddy read for Starla and I and unfortunately we both did not like the book but we will attempt another buddy read coming soon so you know we're still excited to have had the buddy read itself but this is a Roman historical fantasy story with elemental magic. And ultimately, I was able to read 50% of this. This has multi-POVs. It has an interesting Roman setting. It's kind of set on the precipice of a dictator having been killed, and a lot of different people are now trying to vie for political power, and it's transitioning back from a dictatorship to a Roman Republic. Again, interesting stuff. One, I don't feel like I had enough Roman historical context to fully understand everything that was kind of going on in here, but I would say my primary qualm with this story is the writing style I felt was very formal and almost textbook-like. I honestly just could not really get into the story itself, and I don't necessarily need a character-driven fantasy story by any means. I can read a plot-forward book any day, but then I would want the plot to be one where it was unputdownable, very intense, very intriguing, and I also didn't really feel like I was getting that from this book as well. Ultimately, I read 50% of this. I gave it a two-star rating, um, but I did want to shout it out because if you like Roman history and you don't mind a more formal writing style, maybe read a few pages of this. It might be something you like. It has cool magic, a great historical setting, and made me want to learn more about Roman history, but just ultimately wasn't one for me, so I did DNF this. From there, I did take a bit of a break from fantasy and I picked up Get a Life Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is a rom-com contemporary romance story that is so charming and fun that honestly if you like any type of romance you're gonna love this book. Um, this follows our main character Chloe Brown who is a chronically ill computer geek and essentially at the beginning of the story she creates sort of a bucket list for herself to kind of push herself out of her comfort zone and the list is enjoy a drunken night out, ride a motorcycle, go camping, have meaningless but a thoroughly enjoyable hookup, travel the world with nothing but hand luggage, and do something bad. One of the items off this bucket list is to move out of her parents home and kind of establish her own home base um, and there she kind of has this tumultuous relationship with the superintendent there, Red. They hate each other, they don't understand each other, there's all this back and forth, but then obviously there's romance there as well. So this is a story really about Chloe and Red kind of beginning to understand each other, respect each other, doing a bunch of fun bucket list like items. It's charming, it's funny, it's hilarious. Chloe as a main character I loved reading from. She is independent, watching her kind of craft her own business and marketing, something very similar to what I do. And also just like her personality was one that I really 
understood this desire to make lists, to cross them off and to push yourself outside of your comfort zone is something I literally do all of the time. This also has disability rep as Chloe Brown has chronic pain. But ultimately this book was a lot of fun. I read it in like 24 hours. The romance is just chef's kiss. This does have steamy scenes so I wanted to call that out but it's banter, romance, the main characters that you root for, like what more would you want? Not much. So I gave this a four out of five stars. I did think the end wrapped up a little quickly, um, but overall though, it was such a great time. I'm really excited to also read the second book in this series following Chloe's sister, which I hear is Friends to Lovers, which I'm very interested in. <laughs> Next, I read two middle grade novels that were just amazing. The first one is The Girl Who Drank the Moon. This is a very classic, middle grade fantasy story that just like is what I feel like I'm gonna like read to my grandchildren one day. I don't know, it just feels like when I was reading it, it felt like a modern classic in a lot of ways. And obviously, I mean, it won the Newbery Award, so I think a lot of people felt the same when they read it. But this is a story that essentially follows a lot of different characters. It's multi-perspective, and also there's quite a bit of time that passes. But essentially, there is a town called the Proletariat who essentially every year they sacrifice a newborn baby to the forest and to the witch to essentially protect them from her wrath and basically keep their town surviving. But plot twist, the Proletariat's elders basically don't actually believe that there is an evil Witch of the Forest, but instead uses as a tool to kind of keep the populace sad and easy to control. But the reality is there actually is a witch, and the witch comes every year, collects the child, feeds them starlight, and brings them to a neighboring town where they find loving homes for them. One year, however, the witch accidentally feeds the child moonlight instead of starlight, making her magical, which kind of is the beginning of this tale. We follow this girl, Luna, as she grows up and grows up into her magic, follow her as she makes a life for herself in the swamp with her grandmother, as well as this little magical dragon and swamp monster. And you also follow a young man as he grows up into adulthood and he is determined to free his people from the clutches of this evil witch and all of these different factors as well as additional POVs kind of come to a head in a magical whirlwind of just beautifulness. This story is like lessons to be had every which way. But also just like much more expansive than I thought it was going to be going in. I just didn't realize we would be following this book through a 13 year time period, watching all these different characters. It was just so richly crafted and woven together. I also listened to the audiobook of this for the majority of it and loved it. It's on script. The narrator does an exceptional job, one with doing a bunch of different voices, but just having this sort of like come sit by the fire and listen to this tale. I loved this book. I love seeing a young girl come into age, come into magic, protect the one she loves. I love this town kind of realizing their own power and kind of removing the mist from their eyes as they realize kind of that they've been duped for so long. It's so good. I gave this book honestly like a 4.5 out of 5 stars. I had a great time reading it. It was beautiful. And if you like middle grade or not, I would really recommend picking this up. Next book I completed was Arusha and the End of Time by Roshni Chakshi. This is literally exactly what I wanted it to be. This was so much fun, so funny, just like I had a smile on my face the entire time I was reading it. But this essentially follows our main character Arusha who lives with her mother at the museum that she curates. She attends a very prestigious private school where many of the students are very wealthy. Jet set off to very exciting international locales. For this, Aru tends to tell little fibs to try to make herself feel like she's fitting in with her classmates a little better. But at the beginning of this novel, some classmates essentially show up at our doorstep to kind of call her bluff. There she gives them a tour of her mother's museum. And there they essentially dare her to touch an enchanted magical lamp. She does and unwittingly releases the sleeper, which is determined to sort of release an evil force and bring about the end of the world. So Aru has to go on an adventure to try to stop this from happening. Discovers that she is a descendant of one of the Pandava brothers who are essentially demigods of some of the main gods within Hindu mythology. From there, she basically discovers her own godly, like, parent and goes on an adventure with another girl, Minnie, and they're trying to save the day. This is chock full of fun and humor, as I've already said, and, and it has so many fun modern reinterpretations of mythology and adventure situations. For example, the night bazaar that they travel to to try to get certain items is actually inside of a Costco. This just like had me smiling from ear to ear while I was reading it. It was, again, exactly what I wanted it to be. I gave it a four out of five stars. I definitely am going to be checking out other books in this series. I don't know. I love it. I love the lessons. I love the adventure. I love the friendship. It has it all. It was a great 
time. The last two books I completed this month were both nonfiction, anti-racism novels that I'm reading for my own personal education. The first one is So You Want to Talk About Race, and the other one I was able to read was How to Be an Anti-Racist. Both of these books were so excellent. Honestly, I think everyone and anyone from any place around the world would benefit from reading both of these nonfiction novels. They were so well written. I personally took so much from both of them. They're both filled with anecdotal stories combining with like scholarly research and interpretation of modern race within America. They both also have so many tools to add to your own tool belt to make yourself a better ally, to be a better anti-racist, all of these things, particularly until you want to talk about race. There were so many situations that the author goes through that I like highlighted, wrote down, made note of, you know, or I'm in those situations. For example, like a PTA meeting was brought up and she talked about so many different elements that, you know, people need to think about from, because parents all have different realities and experiences. And like, that is just one small example. But again, there was just so many moments of learning I took from both of these novels. And again, I really cannot express that I would say everyone should read these multiple times. And there's also so many things you can physically take from both of these books to reframe your own brain, but also take out into the world around you, which I just feel like they're such valuable reads. So those are the last two books I was able to read this month. Wait, I'm not done. I still have one more book to talk about and that is The Assassin's Quest. I was able to read just over 500 pages of this in the month of July. I'm gonna be finishing it in the month of August. This is the third book to the Farseer trilogy, which I am loving. This third book is the strongest book in the trilogy so far. Character-wise, emotion-wise, plot-wise, it is excellent. I'll give more in-depth thoughts once I actually finish it. Um, but I'm making my way through and was able to read quite a large chunk. 500 pages is like almost two YA novels. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased with how much progress I was able to make in this book as well. So those are all of the books I read in the month of July. Let me know down below some books you've read recently as I would love to know. And I will see you guys soon with another video soon. Goodbye.